Okay, everybody, welcome. Uh, I want to say hello to everyone and welcome you to today's CPDC membership meeting. My name is Jim Perlstein, and as chair of CPDC's board, I'd like to call this afternoon's online meeting to order. Welcome my fellow board members, CPDC's members, guests, members of the media, and of course our, our panelists uh, today. Um, before we begin today, I want to take a few minutes to recognize one of our own here at CPDC who passed away a few weeks back, and that's Ron Rubin. Um, over 30 years ago, in 1989, Ron agreed to chair an effort by CPDC to create a downtown management district. He worked very hard behind the scenes to persuade major, uh, major property owners, prominent businessmen, large retailers, city council, and ultimately Mayor Wilson Good on the importance of creating what was called at the time a special services district. And in 1990, with Ron playing a, a major hands-on role, City Council approved the first step, the formal creation of what is now called Center City District. Paul Levy was recruited by CPDC that same year. And of course, the rest is history. Ron served as a very active chair of CCD for over 10 years. He pushed the staff to go beyond clean and safe and to take on major capital improvements always working in his diplomatic way to build bridges between different business groups, between the business community and city council, and to set high standards of quality as he did in his business, his civic life, and his family life. Ron was a mentor and a friend to many of us, including me, and he will surely be missed. With that, at this time, I'd like to move to the approval of the December 15th, 2020 membership meeting minutes. As I can see, all the virtual hands up in the air, we're all in agreement, and the December membership meeting minutes are now approved. Thank you, board members. Um, our financials and the membership contribution report are both in the packet that was emailed to all of our members prior to this morning's meeting. Uh, please con contact Tony Pipitone if you have any questions on the financial information and uh, Romina Gutierrez if uh, you or you know somebody that would like to join CPDC. Uh, prior to today's meeting, uh, via an electronic vote, all of our CPDC board members held an election and voted to, one, re-elect its Class B board members, as well as, two, re-elect its executive committee members. Those nominated and elected members can be viewed on the slides currently on your screen. So thank you very much to the board members for that. Okay, we have a long program today, so let's get started. Um, this is, is most certainly a monumental day, as we learned earlier this afternoon, that Philadelphia uh, will have a, a full reopening on June 11th. So it's been a long time coming. We can now truly finalize our plans to return to the office, to the classrooms, to shopping, to dining. Uh, we're going to be discussing this and the timing of each uh, much more this afternoon. So with that, I welcome you to our program, the State of Center City 2021, returning to offices, reanimating hotels, and restoring jobs. And I'll now turn it over to our Executive Director, Paul Lee. Jim, thank you very much, and welcome everyone this afternoon. I'm going to spend about 12 to 15 minutes just going through the highlights of our State of Center City report and our May recovery report and then turn it over to Prima Gupta, who will moderate what will be a very interesting and timely panel discussion among Jim, Pearlstein, Jerry Sweeney, and Carol Watson. So let me get underway. We're releasing two reports today, which were perfectly timed, as Jim said, with Mayor Kenny's announcement that he's lifting many of the restrictions, some of them as early as May 21st, some coming on June 11th. But two reports, one, our State of Center City report, which is an annual look back at the prior year. But through this pandemic, we've been doing a monthly recovery report in which we track multiple indicators of recovery. Both of those reports can be found on our website. I'm gonna review both briefly, but the primary purpose of today's forum is to look forward, to get everyone focused on returned, recentered in the center of the city. But we also wanna look beyond where we are today or beyond recovery to expand the circle of recovery citywide. We're gonna need faster and more inclusive growth than we had in the decade prior to the pandemic. The pandemic's economic impact was profound. We lost 120,000 jobs within a 30-day period of time. 
and we are still 78,000 jobs below our March 2020 levels. Our unemployment level is still almost double January 2020 levels. And we also, though, need to step back and take a longer, uh, longer look, because despite a decade of job growth preceding the pandemic, pre-pandemic, we had not yet regained 1990 job levels, and we were far below 1970 job levels. By contrast, peer cities like Boston, New York, and Washington had all surpassed their 1970 job levels, and Philadelphia was still 22% below our 1970 job levels. That lack of jobs lies behind so many of the challenges we need to overcome today. So we need to recover from the challenges caused by the pandemic, but also overcome challenges that predate the pandemic. Now, Center City and University City, along with the Navy Yard, the airport, are great success stories. Center City and University City provide 53% of all Philadelphia's jobs. In Center City, the jobs that we had just prior to the pandemic were quite diverse. 27% were paying 35,000 or below, 56% were family sustaining jobs, and 17% were paying over 100,000. 63% of downtown jobs required less than a college degree, 33% only a high school degree, and so SEPTA made them accessible to neighborhood residents and to people from across the region. So 25% of residents from every neighborhood in the city work downtown, 52% of all downtown jobs were held by Philadelphia residents with a significant number of suburban residents also coming into the city. But citywide, in the last decade, we grew slowly, and we grew far fewer family-sustaining jobs than both our suburbs and other major cities. We have fewer businesses concentrated in the city than in the suburbs. That's less businesses per resident than peer cities. Just for a contrast, Philadelphia suburbs have 17.3 businesses per thousand adults. Philadelphia city has 12.1 businesses per, per thousand adults. That's a 70% density of businesses compared to our suburbs. By contrast, look at Atlanta. They have far more, 140% more business density in their city than in their suburbs. So double the density means more opportunity. We also have a lower level of black owned businesses per black resident. The business density, black business density in Washington, D.C. is 2.8 times that of Philadelphia. Atlanta is 2.5 times that of Philadelphia. New York is 1.9. So black businesses are doubly disadvantaged. The American Rescue Plan enables both a new economic development investment strategy so disadvantaged businesses can grow, but also competitive tax policies so the whole pie can expand. We need at this moment to focus on our competitive context, where our 3.8% wage tax compares to a suburban wage tax of 1%, where our business income receipts tax on gross and net receipts has no suburban counterpart. Now, the impact of the stay at home order on transit was profound as well. We saw a dramatic decline in SEPTA riders, and we're still only back to 33% of the volume. Of, by March 2021. Now, SEPTA and PATCO have extensive cleaning protocols, improved ventilation to create a safe passenger experience. Now, we can contrast the full offices of 2019 with the 2020 offices that never had more than 10% of workers present on average. Now, those with jobs that enabled them to work remotely as we are doing now can celebrate their mastery of virtual meetings. Our success at achieving a whole new live-work balance. But it, we really need to recognize the reality of jobs that disappeared when office workers went remote. Every half million square feet of occupied office space, like that Penn Center building in the foreground, holds not only 3,300 desk jobs. It creates jobs for five building engineers, eight cleaning staff, and 12 security positions. You multiply that times the 40 million square feet of occupied space we have downtown, that's more than 3,000 building support jobs that are at risk. The loss of demand for retail and restaurants, the loss of demand for transit riders, lost business travelers to fill hotel rooms. So staying remote has adverse impact on thousands of hourly workers. 
So it's more than Zoom fatigue that should call us back. It is also about restoring the mentoring and client contacts for younger firm members. It's about restoring vitality and economic opportunity for people from every neighborhood in Philadelphia. 1.2 million square feet of office space was formally vacated last year. That's lost jobs, that's lost tax revenues for the city and the school district. Now with a longer view, we can focus on office rents that have remained low because local tax policy has limited demand from tenants from outside the city. Or we can capitalize on a huge opportunity we have now for attraction, luring tenants from more challenged markets if we can finally get tax policy right. We've recently seen how university and medical research turns into patents that turns into startups, creating huge potential for life sciences growth. We know this is going on very strongly within University City, but many developers and owners are finding a way to secure life science tenants within the downtown. This is a great growth industry for our future. No sector was more challenged than leisure and hospitality. Airline travel plummeted again last March and April. Hotel occupancy dropped. All categories of demand dropped away. So our biggest losses in the city were in leisure and hospitality, which are still 42.5% below where they were a year and a half ago. Education has lost about 8.5% of its jobs, healthcare 5%, the office sector 6%. Now in the last month, if you went down to the Liberty Bell or you went to the Love Sculpture, you saw tourists in line again. We've got new opportunities created by Visit Philly's new campaign, Pack Light and Plan B exciting opportunities to bring visitors back. Next, we obviously need to get the return of conventions and trade shows. The absence of workers and visitors left retail and restaurants with reduced customer volumes. Accommodation and food services are still down 24,000 jobs citywide. Outdoor dining was a very successful lifeline. Streeteries actively supported by the city were a vital reprieve from the challenges. Recovery is clearly underway. Between February 2021 and April, outdoor seating within the boundaries of our district increased from 3,600 to 5,300 seats. That's plus 45% increase. Restaurant week is coming later this month, May 17th to 28th. Pedestrian volumes in the core of downtown are up 75% since January, higher than any week in all of the year 2020. Led by visitors coming back from the region, we're at 63% of pre-pandemic levels, but we're still missing office workers. The good news at the end of April 2021, only 53 of 1,900 ground floor retail premises in the downtown were boarded up. That was 2.8%. The challenge we faced is our vacancy rate in retail rose from 12 to 18%. But 30 new, 37 new retailers opened in Center City in 2020. Seven more have announced openings for this year, and brokers are reporting very strong leasing activity. Giant just announced a new grocery store under the heirloom brand in the former Strawbridge's building. As the Inquirer reported a few weeks back, based on our April report, we have a city waking up, but your presence is requested. Where there are challenges on West Walnut Street, we've coordinated a new window graphic program with owners and brokers of buildings that need to be released. We've got leasing information and demographic information in the windows and including signage for the construction fence in front of the demolished properties on the 1700 block of Walnut Street. These are interim strategies. When office workers return, we can fill in the gaps. We can celebrate full recovery, and downtown living is another success story that we want to quickly talk about. Staying at home simply helped the housing market. The volume of citywide home sales rebounded in June. The third and fourth quarters in 2020 were very strong in Center City. There's minimal evidence of flight from the city. Citywide housing prices in 2020 exceeded 2019, and the first quarter of 2021 prices exceeded 2020. What we call Greater Center City is now up to 190,000 residents. And after spring construction lull, construction quickly restarted. Development jumped beyond the traditional boundaries. Almost 10,000 units of housing were in production 
at the start of 2021. Put this in perspective, Greater Center City's population has grown by 29% since 2000. That's 42,500 new people living downtown. Philadelphia as a whole grew by 5%, and if you subtract center city's growth out, the rest of the city grew by about 3%. So we're a growing city led by some dynamic growth in University City and Center City. Population grew where jobs and transit connections are strongest, where colleges and universities import students, and immigration helped drive population growth in the Northeast. With all this new supply, Rents continued to rise, tapering only slightly in the core. Sales prices continued to rise, tapering only slightly in the core, clearly which had challenges to recover from in 2020. Days on market for sale of houses went down and inflation adjusted prices have continued to rise for nine years. Contrast that with 2008 through 2010. This is part of a long-term trend as a larger share of regional housing permits are being concentrated in the city with two-thirds concentrated around center city. This can be sustained when workers return and job growth resumes. Developer confidence has remained strong. By our count, 25 projects, 3.4 billion in investment was completed or in progress in center city in the boundaries Fairmount to Washington, river to river. We count another 40 projects estimated development value of 3.6 billion in the planning or proposal phases. Just a quick overview, both the Laurel and Art House are rising on the skyline. Toll is proceeding at Broad and Noble. National is moving forward with the, on the 1100 block of Chestnut Street with a 19 story specialty care pavilion for Thomas Jefferson University Hospital. Parkway is now out of the ground on the 2200 block of Market Street for Morgan Lewis. PMC has got new residential towers leasing along the Schuylkill and Brandywine has Schuylkill Yards, mixed use development, labs and apartments getting ready to start. Finally, our role as we saw it during this period of time was to reanimate the center of the city. We reapplied all the lessons from the early 1990s, economic recovery, requires a clean and safe public environment. We kept 110 cleaning staff deployed seven days a week. We expanded our graffiti removal efforts. We continued all our fee-for-service cleaning contracts with adjacent residential neighborhoods. Our community service representatives continued their deployment seven days a week. We continued our homeless outreach, the Ambassadors of Hope, a new code delivery service model with partnered Project Home with center city district staff, with specially trained Philadelphia police. We have a growing need to address quality of life challenges and vulnerable populations through these new partnership approaches to public safety. It's essential for the recovery of center city. The ambassadors of hope helped more than 300 people come off the streets in the last two years to connect with services and housing. They're out there working right now. November 1st, we added eight bike safety patrol officers as a deterrent, visible and mobile, and unarmed presence on the street. We've expanded those bike and vehicle patrols into West Market and JFK in the afternoon to support the return of office workers. We've added two more bike patrol officers on May 1st to begin patrolling on Market Street East. Now, well-managed public spaces are also key to recovery. We began actively reprogramming Dilworth late June, we had concerts for adults in September, festivals for children in October, modified winter programming approved by the health department. Right now, if you haven't been, we've got a roller rink in Dilworth Park in complete compliance with health regulations. We turned on the fountains for spring and we have extensive summer programming for those performing arts groups who can't perform indoors. They will be performing in Dilworth Park. We've got exercise, music, and reading for children and activities for kids in Sister Cities Park. So to conclude, the chamber and the city are now promoting a safe return plan. Mayor Kenny announced effective Friday, May 21st, offices can operate with no density limits, with masks still required in public spaces. That's a huge and positive step for economic recovery. Everyone getting vaccinated now is job one for recovery. The latest stats as of Monday, 61% of those over 65 were vaccinated. 50% of adults have been vaccinated once, 
You can see Philadelphia approaching 40%. The counties are slightly ahead. Burlington's in the lead. Our goal is to get to 70%. We have urged, and you should urge all your employees to get vaccinated. We're at 95% for in-office staff. Our on-street staff was able to be vaccinated early. SEPTA is working to restore full service and transit. It connects residents to opportunity. Ridership levels are increasing. We will have part two of this forum on Monday, May 24th, in which we will have Mike Carroll and Leslie Richards talking about rethinking streets and returning to transit. You'll get that invite shortly. Our role, as I said, has been to restore confidence in public spaces. Office buildings have already made extensive health safety investments and established new protocols, as have all hotels. So it's time to get back to work. It's time to get back to shopping. It's time to get back to restaurants. It's time to book some hotel rooms. It's time for a new cycle of inclusive growth. So I'm really delighted now to turn things over, but first I want to acknowledge all our staff that worked on these reports. This has been a month long effort on page 64, you can find and thank all the staff who worked on this. But now I really want to turn it over to Prima to begin a discussion of people actively involved in the revitalization and employment in Center City. Thank you very much. Thank you, Paul, and, and good afternoon to everyone in our audience. It's great to be with you all, though, of course, I wish we were all physically in the same place. I joined CCD two weeks before the shutdown. I did not expect to spend so much of 2020 in my guest bedroom, and I'm grateful for Paul for not showing a picture of one of my kids doing a jumping jack in the background of a Zoom meeting. It certainly happened. Um, but I'm really proud to be part of this team that's accomplished so much in the last year and has so much important work ahead of us. So we're now going to continue the conversation that Paul started in his presentation with a panel of folks who have given a lot of thought to how we can reanimate the city. They don't need an introduction, but joining us today are Carol Watson, the general manager of Hotel Palomar, Jerry Sweeney, president and CEO of Brandywine Realty Trust, and of course, Jim Pearlstein, president of Pearl Properties and of course, C CPDC president. So let's get started. I encourage those of you in the audience to put questions to Paul or to our panelists um, in the chat, and please let us know who your question is for. So it has been a beautiful spring in Center City. Um, today, the city announced that restrictions are receding, and yesterday we found out that young teenagers can be vaccinated. It's hard not to feel optimistic about recovery. So the question for the panelists is what signs of downtown recovery are you seeing in your business and what other indicators are you watching carefully? Um, Carol, it'd be great if you could start us off. Yeah, absolutely. Today's a very exciting day um, for my industry, for all the news that came out. And for me, I just feel very encouraged that the Philadelphia region, it's really headed in the right direction to lift tourism business. And we're no doubt in the recovery phase, but we're ready and welcome to have welcome everyone back within the business community as well as leisure. Um, but what we're really seeing in the hotel sector is that gradual increase in weekend leisure demand. So as we continue to see the local restrictions, um, the different changes in the local restrictions, we're seeing more and more consumer confidence. And we're seeing a lot more when it comes to outdoor dining and people fe feeling more comfortable in order to come out and spend their time in the city. Um, another indicator that we're really watching is the office occupancy. So the intent to return back to the office, whether it's hybrid or full-time for office workers. So hearing the news about May 21st is very encouraging as that will directly impact our transient business as well as some meetings and events. Great. What about you, Jerry? Uh, and look, I think today is a great day, and it's a uh, it's. Uh, it looks, by the way, Jerry, if I could interrupt you, it looks like somebody is sharing their screen, perhaps inadvertently. It, it's not me. I didn't touch any buttons. <laughs> okay. Sorry but to now, interrupt you. No, look, today today is a great day. I think it's been a lot of folks have been working towards uh, convincing the uh, political leadership in the city to kind of open up the doors, and I think we're real excited about it. And and Carol certainly excited for your industry and. And for all the related industries downtown, I think the uh, it's been a very challenging year. I think we we kept all of our buildings, as we frame it, uh, doors open, lights on, and had all of our staff in our buildings, and have been monitoring uh, progressive 
the uh, tenants coming back. I mean, we, we recently conducted a survey of a number of tenants, captured about 600 of our tenants' feedback. And what we're really seeing is, uh, is, is a couple of encouraging signs. One is almost everyone we talk to can't wait to get back to the office. I know we'll talk about that uh, uh, later in the presentation, but uh, I think there's been a real recognition that uh, folks need to get back together in person. So where we've been running our average occupancy levels in, in, in CBD and University City around uh, 10 to 15 percent, we've actually even seen with the vaccine rollout that tick up very nicely in the last 30 days. And we're seeing significant turnstile counts. Uh, we're, uh, we're, our, uh, we've had about uh, 1,800 virtual tours of our office inventory. Uh, so far this year, so we're averaging uh, 17 tours a day. Our pipeline of uh, prospects has increased by about 400,000 square feet quarter over quarter, which is a really good harbinger of a recovery. People are starting to think about coming back, where they're going to come back, how they're going to come back. And we're hopeful with this recent announcement uh, earlier today that that will accelerate that. We see a real reluctance on the part of larger employers to bring their employees back as quickly as we're seeing with smaller and mid-sized companies. And hopefully with the public policy now congruent with the reopening, we're hoping that some of those larger companies will accelerate their return. But one of our major tenants today uh, start bringing people back in uh, 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 ratably as opposed to waiting till the midsummer uh, or, or Labor Day, so we're uh, we're very encouraged. I think we're tracking again turnstile account security code access. I know a lot of our retail tenants are really excited about today's announcements because those who have really made their trade off of breakfast, lunch, and dinner uh, really can't wait for folks to come back. So uh, all encouraging signs. We think it'll be a couple quarter transition, but I think we're very encouraged with where we are right now. That's great. Jim, what about you? Well, I think that Carol and Jerry are both right on. I mean, our our, our uh, business focuses on mixed uses and mixed use assets. So um, every single asset class has done uh, very differently along the way. Even within apartments, which is our largest asset class, we have very different buildings. Some are geared toward more empty nesters. Some are geared more toward students. Some are geared more towards office workers. So each individual building has its own type of a personality, and it's been obviously a, a big challenge throughout this year. And we are definitely seeing good good leasing going on. We're seeing uh, a lot of improvement, uh, but it's a slow process. It's certainly not like other years, certainly not like a typical leasing season. Um, you know, the machine that has been Philadelphia for uh, such a long period of time, which is Ed's and Med's and, um, you know, that, that kind of window between March and July where you have, you know, that constant uh, influx of people, it's really spread out over a longer period of time because we don't have, you know, large companies that have even announced exactly what they're going to be doing. So the commitments aren't there to come to Philadelphia yet. You see it on the hotel side. Uh, we're seeing what Carol's seeing. We're seeing really nice business pickup on the weekends. Uh, the weeks are still challenged, and I think over time, you know, we're going to start to see that increase. Obviously, the office space uh, is what it is. You know, we're seeing the smaller businesses, like Jerry said, which is primarily in our portfolio, much more uh, flexible in, in operating right now and who they're bringing into the office. But the larger companies um, are still kind of figuring it out and, and deciding what to do for, for a number of reasons. So we're seeing the same things that they are. It's, it's positive. Every day is better than the last, but it's definitely a challenge, and we definitely need to continue to uh, keep our foot on the pedal. That's great. And, and Jerry mentioned this specifically, but all three of you have brought you know, your employees back to the office early uh, ahead, of, ahead of a lot of your peers um, and are now working to encourage others to come back to work. So I'm curious, what do you all see as the value proposition for in-office work? Uh, and Jerry, you mentioned that you know you, you've definitely done a lot of work here. What could could you answer first? Uh, sure, be happy to. Look, I I think what and we we have about 1,200 companies who are in our portfolio, and they range honestly from uh, you know uh, 500 square feet up to 500,000 square feet. So we we, we had a good cross section. And look, I've made a point of talking to a lot of the C-level executives, a lot of our tenants, 
And uh, look, you can't be in the office business today and not be worried about what was going on with people working from home and the accelerated impact of technology. But I think what we've really come to appreciate from talking to a lot of the business leaders is that, you know, we use the term office space generically, but it's really just a physical space to grow and conduct business. And I think folks have really uh, missed the ability to interage. You're kind of doing task specific executions, but the ability to grow a business, the ability to create enthusiasm in your business really comes from that personal interaction of people that work day in and day out together. They form that collaboration. They, they create that energy level that drives businesses forward. So I've been frankly very encouraged uh, uh, with large and small uh, 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 customers we have about these, this, sent, this impending sense of urgency to get back to the office. We're all tired of Zoom and Teams meetings. Uh, you know, uh, it, new employees that you've bought on in the last year have not even met anybody. We're doing virtual interviewing. Uh, it's been very challenging, and I think uh, getting people back into the office is key. And I think every company is operating a little bit differently, but the key has always been, you know, good communication, recognize that we're coming at a very challenging time. Everybody has handled this differently based upon their own individual circumstances and being employers being flexible in recognizing employee concerns and transition periods, I think will be the key for a successful reentry. And both you and Jim have mentioned that the larger companies seem a bit more reluctant or cautious as far as the return, as opposed to smaller companies. Could one of you speak to that? I'm curious. Hey, Jim, you wanna kick off and I'll, I'll add on? Sure. You know, look, is it is it a liability issue, Jerry? You know, there's a lot more there's a lot more decision making that obviously is going on uh, on the larger companies. Um, you know, we've seen very early on in this process that some companies were aggressively trying to get their companies back. I know Paul and I sat on some really great meetings, and FMC was very aggressive in coming back. And and um, you know, every company is different, right? I mean, some companies actually are working in Zoom and they're getting by. Uh, my company, you know, we're ostensibly property managers and and contractor, you know, construction or building. So there is no Zoom. It just doesn't work. You know, we need to take care of our tenants in our buildings. We need, we are door people. We are tenant relations managers. We are maintenance technicians. We are property managers. So there is no such option to have Zoom. The law firms are obviously doing fine. They're in the suburbs, a lot of them. They're on Zoom. Their billable hours are good and they're not in a rush to get back. And who knows what their liability discussions are. So I think that it's business to business. It, it's small to large, but it's also, you know, very much industry to industry. And, um, you know, that, that's the way I see it. Um, and Carol, you probably see it with the travel on the business side. You know, which companies are actually traveling during the week and which companies are not traveling at all? Yeah, absolutely. And I do want to add to this, just the individual impact. I don't want to overlook that. But as an individual, if you're coming downtown into the office spaces, you're using the businesses that are here. So overall, it truly has a tremendous benefit because you're more likely to go to a restaurant, go to a shop, and you then become a part of the recovery process. So for a business, you know, you know, like you mentioned, the doors for the hotel never close, right? We've been operating and we've been doing so safely with the regulations of the city and the CDC and my large brand. So for anyone looking to bring workers in, I would say this is a very safe environment and in this environment that you can actually be a, become a part of the process. So I just really implore people to look at it that way and that this is more of a benefit and it's a benefit to the city. For those working, it creates jobs when you have additional people frequenting Center City and using the services. So I just really implore people to, there are so many benefits and we're doing so safely to come back to the office space. Yeah, so what do you, just to ahead. close the loop there, I think, look, I would, it, it, some of the larger employers are clearly concerned about liability concerns. Uh, but I also mm -hmm. think, I mean, my sense is, I can't speak for, you know, any other company other than ours, but uh, I think it, 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 being that it's been such a unique experience for all of us, right. uh, we've never dealt individually or collectively with a pandemic in our lifetimes. Uh, and, and it's impacted everybody individually. 
And, and you know, we've had some people that have not really been that concerned about it at all. Other people that are really very, very mm -hmm. sensitive and very, very afraid of what the impact would be. So I, I think for the smaller and mid-sized companies, be, no matter what business they're in, I think if you have 50 employees or 400 employees, it's a lot easier to take personal touch with your employee base as opposed to if you have 50,000 employees. Uh, right. Because, you know, I think what we've learned through all of our communication with our employees and, and working with some of our key tenants is, is, you know, every employee is an individual story. And the adaptability of that person varies based on their personal circumstance. Some people have children that aren't back at school. Some people have a, a health condition. Some folks have elderly partners or elderly parents they need to take care of. So I, I think flexibility has really been a distinguishing factor between the ability for the smaller and large companies to be more flexible with their workforce, as opposed to the very large employers having to treat uh, you know 20,000 employees, each one is an exception condition. And I think is, the, the vaccine adoption rate accelerates, more public policy announcements like today come out. So there's a, an imp, a stamp of approval from uh, health officials on coming back to work. I think that'll start to remove some of the gating issues out there for even some of these larger employers. So what advice might you give to other employers who are planning their returns back, having done it yourselves? Well, I, 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 I would please. say, uh, go ahead. I'm sorry, Jim, go ahead. Now, go ahead, please. I would say that, you know, we've been back as soon as we were allowed to come back with essential workers, and, and it's been very comfortable in our office. So I would say, dip your toe in. We have temperature readings at the door. You know, our, our areas are cleaned every day. When we have meetings, we wear masks. When you're in your office, you don't need to. It's a very comfortable environment in our corporate office right now. So my, that, that's, that's what I would say. I would say dip your toe in, do the right things. We are in a very, very different space right now with the vaccinations taking place. So I think as soon as you start, you'll start to feel more and more comfortable um, and, and your employees will as well. Yeah, I, I would add on to Jim. Look, I, I think we, we, we've approached from two different vantage points. One is with our own employee base. Uh, and bringing people back in again about a third of our workforce never left the office some of our staff functions did uh so we cycled folks back in uh, we've all been back since may 4th uh, the entire company but it's all how you communicate with everybody and make sure that they're comfortable we set up an hr uh, communication chain through our company to make sure that people that did have unique circumstances received a fair hearing for what their concerns were uh, and then in a broader context with the uh, 1,200 companies we have in our portfolio, you know, our property management teams have stayed in close communication with each of their tenant contacts. We've, we've published uh, individual return to work decks for every single one of our buildings. That's been circulated to all of our, all of our tenants for them to circulate to all of their employees. So I think Jim's counsel is wise. You kind, you kind of, you know, come back on a on a segmented rotational basis. But I would I would urge everyone to coordinate with their landlords. You know, we have a lot of really good commercial landlords in the city, uh, and a lot of them, whether they're working through BOMA or working through other uh, uh, professional organizations or just working within larger frameworks like a Brandywine, we want people to come back, but we want people to come back safely and we want them to be safe once they're back. So there's a, there's a real shared obligation to create the right platform for return. So we encourage our tenants to do is get educated on the, uh, the, uh, the, the individualized uh, presentation deck for each building, reach out to our property managers and building engineers to make sure that we understand how they're gonna sequence back in so we can handle things as simple as, you know, riding in the elevator so we can sequence sequence mm -hmm. employee returns it, it, but it all comes down to that personal connection point between you know the employer the employer the employee and the employer and the landlord to make sure that there's a great network great ma matrix of shared responsibilities and understanding to bring people back in it's not that hard to do and it's very fundamental and what we've found is that most people when they come their first day back in they're really happy, like Jim touched on. It's great to, it's like, you know, going to a family reunion again. 
People are back in, they feel more productive, they feel that sense of energy, and they feel that sense of safety that you know the really good landlords care about how the people in those buildings are treated and how they fare during their time in the workplace. Oh, that's great, that's so helpful. So shifting from policy to physical changes, um, I'm curious about what changes you all have made for your tenants or for your hotel guests. And I'm curious, what do you think will be temporary um, as we move out of this, as we continue to move out of this um, crisis and what might be permanent? So Carol, do you wanna lead us off? Sure, so for my industry, really it's the social distancing. We need to continue that until it's safe to be able to, to come together um, in certain ways. So for us, it's leaning in first with what's keeping everybody safe and healthy. But I do see over time as the vaccination rate increases and if you're in groups of fully vaccinated individuals, that will change how we meet and how we interact socially within the hotel space. Um, the part that I feel will really be permanent is having options for remote and hybrid. Um, in-person collaboration is, is there's there's nothing that can beat that, and there will always be in-person collaboration. But I do see the use of technology for connecting individuals from remote locations to patch them into on-site locations as being more of a permanent fixture than a one-off, as it was um, more so one-off pre-pandemic. That's great. Jim, thoughts? I, you know, we were, th we were thrown into this primarily as an apartment owner and, and very different than hotel and office because last March, nobody was staying in the hotels. Nobody was in the office buildings and everybody was holding up in their apartment. So from our standpoint, we looked at it very differently. We didn't have a choice and we didn't have to figure out, okay, this is what we're going to do. We needed to protect our tenants and we need to protect our employees who had to protect our tenants. So it was really a, a, a pretty crazy couple of weeks to figure out exactly what we needed to do. And our maintenance techs were in PPE gear and, and we cut down on any maintenance unless it was essential. And we had to manage mask wearing and social distancing and no guests and closing amenities. And it was not something that was easy to do but once we started to do it and a couple of weeks in when the tenants became very comfortable with what we were doing our buildings we felt became a safe haven they became a place where people were actually comfortable to be during this awful time and as that progressed over time i think that really helped center city i think like jerry said there are a lot of good landlords here not all but there are a lot of good landlords here and i think collectively we made the residential community in Center City, Philadelphia feel pretty good about living here. And, and, the, and the types of things that they've seen over the last six to eight months, that's what we're on this call about. We're, we're here to tell everybody, it's okay. It's okay here, you know? The weekends are actually been really, really normal. We just need to get those office tenants back. So like Jerry said, we can start serving breakfast in the morning, you know, and, and pretzels at, and, at lunchtime. So it's, it's really, the weekends feel normal. The neighborhoods feel really normal. It's just a matter of in the core of this city, we need to get the business travelers back. We need to get the office tenants back. And, and um, we need to feel good. And I think the residential portion of this city will vouch for that. Jerry? Yeah, look, I, I agree with both uh, what Carol and, and, and Jim outlined. You know, look, I think, uh, you know, anytime you're in a crisis, you always got to focus on, on danger and opportunity. So I think uh, just like Jim and Carol outlined, our major focus was, you know, let's cover the danger side of the equation. Let's make sure our buildings are, uh, are, uh, are completely where we want them to be. Fortunately, we always have a, we have a pretty aggressive uh, capital maintenance program anyway. But we you know upgrading filtration systems, increasing fresh air intake, uh, using different types of technology to make sure that the buildings are, are even cleaner than they were before. Uh, wayfinding systems, uh, all the temperature so all uh, pretty all the things that pretty much everyone else did uh and i think and then also communicating that out to our tenant base on a fairly regular basis a lot of communications with our tenants uh a lot of coordination with uh, with our teams and their teams and then i think you know i'm not sure what the answer is in terms of what's permanent and what's temporary you know we've done 
uh, pro bono space planning for about half a million square feet of our tenants here in the city. And uh, to kind of get a sense of what tenants are thinking, you know, they want to move away from bench, bench seating, you know, small, low profile workstations to go to fixed offices. And I think we've seen it's all across the board. Uh, you know, uh, we're, we're certainly seeing more requests for more fixed offices versus uh, bench seating, uh, higher partition workstations, greater circulation patterns. Uh, but I don't know if that's a durable trend line or not. I remember uh, you know, being on a panel with, with uh, a doctor who specialized in pandemics and her, her observation was, you know, never doubt the resiliency of the human spirit. Uh, and she went back and looked at a number of other pandemics in the course of human history. And she said, that, you know, every pandemic was a precursor of the demise of something. And none of that ever really was the it, it came to fruition. So I don't know when people start coming back and they start getting comfortable with business travel, going to airports, using public transportation, you know, what the what the long term implications are. I do think there'll be two, though. I, I think that there will clearly be a, a higher focus on quality, uh, both in terms of presentation, physical composition and sponsorship. I mean, we're seeing that. In even our residential price, even our few hotels, where you know who who's running those hotels, uh, uh, who's running the apartment project, really does start to matter. And on the commercial office side, it's been interesting that you know if you have a 50-page RFP from a tenant who's looking for an office proposal, they had you know pages 43 through 50 were you know the technical specs, you know vertical transportation, HVAC, fresh air intake, all those things, uh, they're now front page. So, you know, we're definitely seeing a lot of uh, office prospects uh, looking to move out of the older office buildings into the newer, higher quality buildings. Because again, if you think about the psychology, they're very focused on, you know, the leadership of those companies are very focused on what they're bringing their employees back to. So I think a, a, a clear focus on quality sponsorship uh, will remain uh, top of mind, at least have some level of permanence until we're completely through the pandemic cycle. And that's great. Does anyone else have any thoughts on things that might be permanent? I mean, I'm struck by the fact that a lot of the folks out there saying most definitively that work from home is, is permanent are tech companies who obviously benefit seeing as how technology has enabled a lot of work from home. So I'm just curious if either of you have ideas. I like Jerry's a lot. Things that might be permanent. Otherwise, we can move on. Well, I, I, I will say this about Philadelphia. You know, we've always heard about Philadelphia doesn't have the highs and lows of other cities. And, and, and I think this is a perfect example of that. I mean, we read about New York and we read about San Francisco right now. And we read about Chicago and we do some business in Chicago and they're having very, very different conversations than we're having on this today. So Philadelphia is not as office dependent for its center city as a lot of these other cities are. We do have mixed uses. We have residents, we have the schools and the eds and meds and, and, and we have the retail and we have a lot going on in this city. So I think from that standpoint, um, you know, we have, we have a lot of things to be thankful for, for. And, and we have, uh, you know, a, a, a lot of work to do before we get back to some normal. But let's face it. I mean, we are not sure yet what this means. We, we do not know. Is it, is it possible that 10% of people don't ever come back five days a week? They come back four days a week? You know, uh, does remote work in the suburbs start to increase? We really don't know yet. So I think that we need to look at it and say, time will tell. We're not as office dependent as every other major city in, in our neighboring cities. And, and we need to do what we can do to, to fix, fill that gap, if that's, if that's the case. Yeah, I think just a real, real, real quick, don't mean to interject, but it, it's a couple of anecdotes. We, we have a, we have, we're, we're a very large landlord in Austin, Texas as well, with a lot of tech tenants. And uh, I, I, even their perspective, Prima, is, is dramatically evolved. I mean, I think, you know, early on, it was this, everyone's going to work remotely in these tech companies. And even, I will tell you it, from firsthand experience, even some of these tech companies who have announced a predominantly work from home strategy are looking at more office space. 
So, you know, a couple of anecdotes I've heard from uh, C-level executives I've talked to, you know, uh, uh, one is that, you know, they, they were targeting about 10% of their workforce to work permanently from home. Uh, and uh, they weren't sure it's gonna be 10, 15%, whatever. Uh, they, they couldn't find any of their employees who wanted to work from home permanently. When, it, you know, 90% of their colleagues were back in the office because there's this fear of like, I don't be the only, only one on my team who's kind of on a Zoom call and everyone else is having coffee around a conference table. Uh, and and another, another anecdote was, it, was, was, was a simple statement by a CEO who said, look, I, I'm pretty well convinced Sweeney, that when all the bosses come back, all the employees will want to come back. Uh, so you, you can't underestimate the power of the human dynamic. You know, people want to advance their careers. They want to build relationships at work. They want to be exposed to a lot of different things. And you can't necessarily get the same level of, of richness to your career if you're working in isolation. The last anecdote was some of those employees that were targeted to work from home on a permanent basis were very reluctant to give up their place in the office because <laughs> that, that, that's their, you know, it's like the, that, like WK up in Cincinnati from years ago, had you like your own little place. I mean, you know, people tend to be nesters and whether it's a cubicle or an office, you, you like your, you like that physical space to identify with uh, uh, in most companies, certainly exceptions to that. But I think I, I really am, I, I'm going to be very interested to see this kind of a great experiment in human psychology of what's going to happen over the next couple in terms of how people get back to the workplace. Jerry, just yeah. to add on to that, I, I, I think that everything you're saying is true. And in addition, we're an affordable city for office space. So, you know, you might see decisions being made in New York City or in Washington, D.C. that go beyond what you're talking about. They might, because of financial reasons, decide not to go back. And I think that Philadelphia can be the beneficiary of that. You know, our yeah. cost of living, cost of office space. And, and, and I'm sure your company is starting to see those types of, of tenants. If they're going to cut back, those tenants might start to come here a little bit more. No, Jim, I agree completely. And, and we're actually beginning to see some of the early signs of that. Uh, what's also interesting, I, 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 uh, one of the multifamily publications had had a report of like what cities were benefiting from a flight out of New York City. And Philadelphia is one of the top recipients of that. So I think that issue of affordability, accessibility to the Northeast Carter, uh, rich, vibrant neighborhoods, all those things, I think, play into some of the green shoots that can really make Philadelphia recover from this pandemic quite nicely and hopefully accelerate some of the trends that were beginning to be in place before we hit the pandemic. I mean, that's a great point. Yeah, just to add to that quickly. So for the folks that come through the doors of the hotel that we speak with, this is exactly what they're saying. For the people who live in New York or live in other cities, whether they're coming here to look at, you know, purchasing an apartment or to experience the city for a getaway, they're saying all of these points. And Philadelphia is very attractive. And from the current tenants, they're very invested um, in their neighborhood. And so that's who's a lot of the people who've been coming, recommending their friends, family, and restaurants. So it's a very appealing, appealing destination to live and work. That's great. I think one of the things that we've been brainstorming a little bit about in the office is how can we attract those remote workers, those alleged remote tech workers, to Philadelphia. I think it's a real opportunity for the city. Um, shifting gears a little bit, um, you know, there are a few recovery campaigns in the city. Um, Visit Philly launch Pack Light Plan Big. There is also Ready Set Philly. I mean, Carol, if you could share your thoughts on the tourism campaign with the group, that would be helpful. Right. So the tourism campaign, it ties directly into what we've been seeing, and that will help with our gradual recovery as we continue to navigate these times. The people who are staying in our hotels, they want to come for a quick getaway, experience the city, see what's available to them, and be able to do so very quickly so that, you know, pack light and experience the city directly plays into that. Um, it also taps into sometimes what we don't talk about, the green spaces available in Philadelphia. So we have a very great advantage where you can walk very closely to many different places and experience outside where it's very comfortable, very safe to do so outdoors as well as indoors. 
and this campaign is just putting on the radar for those who maybe have just had their vaccine or thinking about traveling again. This is putting directly on their radar how they can do that and experience it in Philadelphia. That's great. And then Jim and Jerry, do you have any thoughts about Ready, Set, Philly? Like how is the campaign working and, and what else do we need to do to get people back to work? Well, I mean, let's face it, you know, the, the city hasn't been energized, right? I mean, all those things that make our city so special, uh, people have been away from or they just don't remember maybe. So these campaigns are extremely important. They're a reminder. They're, they're showing all these amazing attributes of Philadelphia. You know, whether that's going to the ballpark or whether that's coming in for brunch or whether it's it's going to the uh, museums uh, or Fairmount Park or or the Parkway or whatever it may be. So I think that both of these campaigns are extremely important. I don't think it's enough. I think we've got to hit it much harder and it should be a constant reminder of all the amazing things uh, that that make our city great. And, and, I mean, people just it, it, we're energized. We're ready to go. Uh, we're opening, we're, we're here, and, and I think we just got to get people dip their toe back in and, and we'll have them. Yeah, I, I agree. Look, I think the most, the, the most, one of the most positive things about both of those campaigns and a few other ones that are in the offing is engagement. I mean, I, I think getting people engaged is the first step towards success. And, you know, we all know that we have a, gr we have a great story to sell here in Philadelphia. And I think the uh, the engagement by a lot of people participating in these undertakings reflects that commitment and that energy. And only good things can come from that. And I, I actually, like on the Ready, Set, Philly, I think it's wonderful that the city of Philadelphia and the Chamber of Commerce are collaborating on that. I think they're building a pretty wide a, a stakeholder base. Uh, and I think initiatives like that, the PR campaign, I frankly think SEPTA has done a really nice job of getting out there and communicating with folks and trying to allay concerns about public transportation, all the great things they've done. So uh, look, we are, we've always been a city of green shoots. The challenge has been to turn those green shoots into trees. And I look at things like Ready, Set, Philly, Pack, the, the uh, Pack Light uh, Plan Big and a few other things as a real seminal point in this, in various aspects of city leadership getting really engaged and beginning to truly sell the Philadelphia story because it is a good story to sell. Okay, so that's the positive. What else needs to be addressed in order for us to accelerate recovery and enjoy even more growth? What do we Nobody need to work just on? Say, okay. <laughs> Anyone? Well, I, I'd say uh, I, I'd say uh, we need to make sure that everybody knows the city's safe, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, without the city being safe, you might as well stop right there. So I think we need our leadership, we need our business leaders, we need everybody that that has a vested interest in the city to to come together and make sure that everything uh revolves around safety and security in the city other quality of life issues we we all need to uh, stay on top of um and and this is this is what paul does you know whether it's noise whether it's trash whether it's our homeless issue that we have um whether it's uh you know a petty crime um you know and 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 paul's doing a great job of, of having um you know uniformed uh I don't want to call them officers, but they're they're uniformed security guards on bikes, and and we're increasing that right now at at CCD. So these are the types of things that people have to feel safe, right? And and we need to work on that much better than we are. Yeah, I would second that. It's really the quality of life and cleanliness. We have you know positive. We have a lot of construction happening, um, but just really that cleanliness piece, and again the quality of life, making sure that when people are here that they're not only able to enjoy everything we have to offer, but as they're walking around and navigating the city, they feel that safety and security as a visible upfront presence. So additional support from the city, absolutely. CCD has done you know, a tremendous job in supporting those efforts, but additional efforts geared towards that specifically will help to position us as you think about, there are many choices for people when it comes to destinations. and. We have so much to offer. We want when they do arrive 
to have that example of what a great destination is. So for sure, the quality of life. That's great. So the okay. last question I'll ask before we turn it over to, I think we have a few audience questions and um, and Paul should, Paul should come back when he's able to. What opportunities do you see for Philadelphia as the pandemic moves into our rear view mirrors and, and we move beyond this all to, to thrive as a city? What are some opportunities? Jerry, do you want to start? Uh, sure. I, I think I think we're in a very interesting pivot. I really do as a city. And, uh, you know, I think the, we've all learned a lot coming out of the pandemic about how things can change overnight, how fragile recovery can be. Uh, I mean, as uh, I was looking at Paul's slides when he was going through them, and I, Paul, I've seen a number of them a number of times, and the, the story is always the same. Uh, so one of the one of the real pivot points is can we change the story? But look, I think, you know, uh, trying to grow our job base and be more active in soliciting uh, businesses to come to Philadelphia. You know, it, I think Jim had touched on earlier uh, the eds and meds and the life sciences. You know, Philadelphia has a true opportunity to become a, you know, a top life science cell and gene therapy uh, ecosystem and dramatically grow jobs. I think we have spot opportunities to grow our manufacturing base. Uh, I think we have a wonderful opportunity to kind of focus on building neighborhood business carters, which can add a level of vibrancy that the city hasn't seen in a number of years. And I think to drive all of that, you need kind of thoughtful public policy that recognizes that uh, the uh, that, you know past performance is not always an indicator of future performance. And that if you, unless you change some of the things that created the past performance, you're probably just gonna replicate history. And uh, I think the fragility of our tax system coming out of this coming out of this pandemic, I think Paul's done some great work on that and raised some good slides. I, I do hope, I think it is that pivotal moment, seminal moment for the city leadership to think about what they envision the city being like in 20 years. We've been fighting you know, affordability issues, we've been fighting poverty issues, we've been uh, fighting social equity, economic equity issues. They're readily solved by uh, by a systemic program of economic growth, and job creation, uh, and uh, look at the, the numbers. Paul talked about the number of jobs we lost. We you know 62% of the jobs we created were jobs that paid less than $35,000 a year. We need we need to change that dynamic going forward. So, I I think lessons learned coming out of this, uh, hopefully will be, how do we better position Philadelphia in an increasingly competitive environment by marrying economic and effective tax policy, economic growth with effective tax policy. Carol, Jim, that's well, an opportunity. Just, you know, just like I, I was saying, I mean, Philadelphia really doesn't have those highs and lows that our neighboring cities have. And I think we have an opportunity here to take advantage of that. I mean, you know, I, I think New York's going to take a long time to come out of this. I think D.C. is going to take a long time to come out of this. And, you know, there are very, very few cities in this country that are as energetic and lively and 24-7 as Philadelphia. It's a fact. I mean, if you have you been to Phoenix after 7 o'clock at night? Have you been to Dallas after 7 o'clock at night? You know, these cities pretty much live off of their office workers and they close down. There are very few, very few cities in the country uh, that have what we have, as well as the place amenities, the parks, the charm, the walkability, the museums, the diverse group of people that live here. So we have a real opportunity to actually take from some of those cities. We really do. We don't have the climate, you know, people aren't going to Florida and going to the Southeast right now uh, that, that would come to Philadelphia, but they certainly would from the Northeast states. So I think we have a real opportunity over the next couple of years, if we jump on this, to take advantage of that. Yeah, and I would say just to add is looking, because we have this opportunity of what does it look like to promote minority businesses and what types of businesses are we looking to support in this recovery process to add to the fold of what we already have established here in Philadelphia? 
So we've gotten a bunch of questions, uh, some easy, some hard. Let me start with the easy one. Maybe I'll start it, aim it at you because it's a question from Tom Eshelman about, you know, we're starting to have people return to come to restaurants. Will outdoor seating remain? What's been the city's posture on that since you've worked on that? And Carol, a follow-up to you, how has that whole outdoor seating look to visitors coming into the city? So do you see outdoor seating staying out there, Prima, as we come out of this and restaurants start to rebuild? Paul, this isn't what I agreed to. I thought I was the moderator. Um, <laughs> happy to answer that one, though. Um, I think I will say what the city has done in the last year, um, the partnership between the city's Commerce Department and Otis, and this is a little bit of a teaser, I guess, for the, the program we'll be having in a couple of weeks with Mike Carroll, um, has been phenomenal. I think they've been incredibly nimble, um, and they have done work that is decidedly outside of their comfort zones to open up the city's right of way for, for some of these restaurants survive. It's really been a lifeline. Um, I think it's, my personal opinion is, I think it's one of those things where you can't put the genie back in the bottle. I think it will, it, in some ways, was one of the most optimistic images from 2020. And I think that, you know, people have really embraced it. And so I think at, at a certain level, and I think this will happen citywide, I think a lot of the new typologies for using the streets to support restaurants and hopefully retail as well will continue. At least I'm hopeful. So Carol, tell us a little bit about who have been your guests in your hotel and then what do they think about when they see all this outdoor dining? Right. The people that have been here, a lot are local. So from the suburbs, as well as all the neighborhoods in Philadelphia and really that New York, New Jersey, Delaware area. We do have some that come from different states, but it's really been local. And what they see is they really enjoy the outdoor dining. It's been a great amenity and benefit for them to be able to dine outdoors and for us as a business to be able to expand our presence. And it's really something that is a positive um, that I see is here to stay and expanding where it can do so. And from a guest perspective, it's, it's adding to the, to the experience, right? You're in a downtown urban environment, but it's a lot more options to experience outdoors. So it's a very much an amenity that we're looking to continue for years to come. Great, now the harder question, which I mean, you started to address it in the questions about quality of life, but several people emailed about the ATVs, the all-terrain vehicles moving around the street, how disruptive that has been for residents, residents people in hotels. Jim, sort of give me your perspective. You started to talk about that, but what, what do you think needs to be done here so that we can focus on this more? Well, you know, we've read over and over about the illegality of this happening. So, you know, you, you have uh, throughout the entire night, you know, you have up and down Broad Street, you have literally next to uh, diners uh, on the on the side streets uh, with this you know, going on. So it, it's it's a major problem. I, I, I question why the administration isn't more on this issue. Um, there's been some really terrible crime on it that's been public and, um, you know, visual. Um, so yes, just like we were talking about, there are quality of life issues that need to be addressed, you know, and it starts with safety and then it goes to noise and it goes to cleanliness and it goes to all these other issues about li lifestyle issues in center city. So that's you know that that's front and center right now. That's that's an issue that's got to be dealt with, and somebody from the city has to step up and take a lead on that. You know, I think people know who are, are part of this. At, uh, but Councilman Squill, Alan Dom have introduced legislation to give the police some more tools. Uh, Deputy Commissioner Dales has a whole task force. So I think we're getting close to people pulling the trigger on that and really addressing that issue. But that came from multiple people. Uh, Paul Spanky asked the question about, well, do you agree with the city's estimate financially that only 85% of suburban workers will come back? Let me sort of phrase that differently. Jim, you raised the question, you're not really sure. Jerry, from your point of view, um, I mean, from my point of view, let me just articulate it. I think we set the goal of getting 100% back. We don't settle for 85%, we go for 100%. But what are the strategies, I guess, Jim, from your point of view, and then Jerry, to, to, you know, do we get to 100%? How do we do that as a business attraction and a business return effort? I, I feel it's quality of life issues. I really do. I think um, when if the comfort level is there, we're going to get 100% back. I really, really do. I believe that. 
Um, I know from a residential standpoint, in 2019, we had created more and more groups of renters, more and more demographics. We had a, a lot of empty nesters coming into the city. We had a lot of people selling their home in the suburbs and having an apartment in town and, and maybe having a place at the shore that they were either renting or buying or going to Florida. We had a whole demographic of that. We had we had uh, young young families with kids, you know, age, you know, uh, toddler to 10 uh, increasing so that those ages were increasing. Um, you know, we can get all that back. We can get all that back. And when that comes back, the office will, will follow as well because the employers are pressured to have everybody back when you're comfortable living here. So I, I, I'm optimistic. I don't know how the office environment necessarily plays out with some of these larger companies. Um, it, there's a lot of culture, there's a lot of technology, um, but I'm confident that if we take care of our business and the stuff that we can control as a city, that we'll be 100% back. Barry, from your point of view, sort of what you're hearing from tenants, what your goals are? Yeah, look, our, our goal is, uh, is, to, is to get back more than 100%. I mean, we're, we're trying to grow the pie here. So uh, I, I think the, uh, the points that uh, Carol and Jim uh, and Prima made were very much on key. I, you know, look, we're, we're in the era of the importance, the power of the message. So I think that the more powerful the message that the city sends out in terms of these quality of life issues, Jim, that you're speaking to, uh, the safety, the, uh, those types of things start to break down whatever gates there might be for people coming back in. Uh, but I do believe that uh, as we're here talking to a lot of our tenants, we're, we're not really seeing uh, this real big push to kind of move from the core, you know, from CBD or University City or, or Philadelphia out to the suburbs. Uh, I, I, my guess is there'll be one or two companies that will probably think about it from that standpoint. But, you know, you can't replicate the richness of the quilt we have here in Philadelphia in any suburban location. Uh, you can come close, but you can't do it. And I think that uh, uh, selling all those messages, we're talking about public spaces, uh, uh, you know, now's the time we should be, you know, over-programming public spaces. Now's the time that we should be, you know, advocating for, you know, geographic equity of our streets between, you know, outdoor eating facilities, more bike lanes, more, uh, more pedestrian friendly. I think the more that we can do to kind of convey a consistent message that, you know, this this city is not defined just by the asphalt. The city is defined by the vibrancy of the streetscapes. I think you'll wind up getting people back down because the, the, that's what will bring people into, into it back to the city. It's not, you know, necessarily where they work. It's what they do in the environment where they work. And there's no other, there's no comparable quality set in the region except for center city philadelphia and university city philadelphia but the the reality is that those dynamics create excitement uh, we're coming out of an era of tremendous isolation by companies and by individual employees we're all looking for ways to connect i mean even as we've opened up sierra green and drexel square our public spaces here i mean the level of the level of reaction has been amazing uh, yeah, I look down and look at the, how crowded Sierra Green is with people just being out and about and talking to people, mask, no mask, whatever their dynamic is on their vaccine. But that's they're, this, they're the tiny little points that we need to amplify citywide. And that's where the power of the messaging, you know, Paul, from your organization, other organizations like yours, the city, uh, the hotel and visitors bureau, those are the, they're, they're the, they're the individual patches that quilt the great fabric. You know, I mean, it's uh, that's where we got to get to because it, I, I don't think there's any question people will come back in. And I think actually there's a momentum we can build to bring more people back in if we handle it all the right way. So, Carol, I mean, you've got people who are not necessarily convention goers. You really get within regional and tourists and you get business travelers. We have cultural institutions opening. When you look forward to September with performing arts, what does that mean for your Yeah, for performing arts, what that means for our hotel is a direct correlation to additional occupancy. Every time we've had some something tied to tourism, there's been an increase in hotel occupancy. So with 
that I'm anticipating that we'll have even higher weekend occupancies uh, from a city perspective. You know, it's around 60%. That will definitely help to bolster those weekend occupancies. And it also gives another layer to the people who live in the city because they're able to enjoy, invite their friends and family into the city. And really, once people come to Philadelphia, what I've found, like, you know, how you kind of mentioned, Jim, you know, put your toe in, it's once they experience it, they want to experience more. So I do feel that the theater's opening will bring another layer of that dynamic to us. I guess looking forward, I mean, uh, you know, we put out these two reports on recovery and we really, I think, are optimistic about what's coming down the road. I mean, when you look ahead, Jerry, to September, what do you see in terms of office tenants and people back? I know lots of people are saying, am I coming back June 1st, July 1st, for your conversations with tenants? Where do you think you're going to be on September 1st or just after Labor Day? Yeah, I, I think we'll be back to full occupancy. See, I, I think that, uh, you know, even the surveys we've done of, of uh, those that 600 tenants, uh, you know, the, it's been amazing. We've done a number of those during the pandemic. And I think a lot of companies stopped giving timelines when they were coming back because they were talking moving back previous deadlines or timelines. Uh, so I, I think most companies will be back by Labor Day. So, I, I mean, we, we've just... It, given the traffic increases we've seen just in the last 30 days, and I think with this announcement today, that again is another freeing exercise for a lot of employers uh, to because if there's a, there's congruent public policy. Uh, just given what our entire research from our tenant base about the desire to get back sooner rather than later. Well, today with the announcement of the city, sooner became a more high probability outcome than later. Uh, so, uh, and I think a lot, you know, actually an interesting dynamic is I'm, I'm starting to hear from some of our, some of our, our tenants that, you know, this idea of coming back after Labor Day, which was kind of, uh, the, uh, the default answer, uh, six weeks ago is now kind of moving up into mid-summer where people are concerned about the, well, why are we going to, why are we going to have everybody work from home during the summer when it's safe to come back? So I think that, you know, I'm, I'm looking forward to, uh, some of the major employers in the city announcing that they're going to be bringing people back in. You know, Jimmy had mentioned FMC. I mean, they've been at the vanguard of uh, of bringing folks back. They've they got great collaboration with our team. FMC is sponsoring a vaccine center in, our, in, in, in the FMC tower. We're seeing that with a number of the other major employers. So I think having a couple of our major employers announce they're bringing their employees back sooner will be a major catalyst to bringing everybody else back. Uh, uh, and I'm hopeful that that happens in the next couple of weeks. We've seen a couple of the big four accounting firms start to bring their folks back, a couple of the law firms bringing their folks back. And uh, that was before today's announcement. So I'm hoping that, you know, Paul, after today, there'll be a real accelerating trend. I mean, that's my opinion too. I know you and, and Jim have been on a set of calls with major employers. And whatever the concerns over the pandemic or vaccination or other issues, the key, key, the key question that kept coming up is, well, what's the city saying? What's allowed? And I think this decision by the mayor and the health commissioner is incredibly positive because it opens the door. It says to people, it is now permitted, it is now safe to come back under certain protocols. And then I always use this analogy. When we first started to see people sitting out in the streets, a year ago in outdoor seating, it was only 25 and 30 year olds. And within a week, it was 35 and 40 year olds. And pretty soon it was 55 to 75 year olds. That is, people wanted to see what the leaders were doing, what other people were doing. And I think that's the momentum that's going to start here. There's been a lot of people tentative waiting to see. There's been a series of early leaders. And I think this opens the door. The mayor's announcement's incredibly positive because it opens the door for this return. I was just going to wrap up and just ask if each of you had any concluding thoughts. But for me, the, such the obvious thing, we've talked so much about how we have built a 24-hour downtown, but the interconnectedness of our economy, 
The absence of office workers means the lack of business travelers. The absence of office workers means a loss of SEPTA riders. The return of arts and culture means people coming back. And I think the interconnectedness, so certainly one message from me is everybody who thinks they're comfortable working remotely needs to understand the implication of the many other jobs that aren't coming back, back until they come back. So I think there's a real opportunity for a lot of people to join hands together and jump in together. Jim, concluding remarks from you and then Carol and Jerry about, you know, what's the message for everybody who's on the fence or thinking about what they need to do at this point? Well, I, I think I just want to reiterate how, how monumental today is. You know, we're, we're in May. We're 14 months from when we left the office and as I like to say, you know, we got, I, I at the company got everybody together and, and said, here's a little money, go to Target and get toilet paper and paper towels, because I don't know what this means. And next thing you know, we're not even allowed back in the office. So that was only 14 months ago. You know, and it's, it's, it's hard to keep that in perspective. This has been a very, very difficult 14 months. But we now can open up, you know, and I think it's got to, it's got to stop being political and it's got to start being based on science and data. And we have, to, we have to have leadership here and start getting back to the normal things that we do. And I think, I think these, these campaigns are really, really important. And I think these companies that have leadership that, that Jerry's speaking of and his buildings are very, very important. I'd really like to see some of these major law firms start making some announcements and coming back. I think that's really key for us. And I think sooner than later, like Jerry said, I don't think it's September. I think it's sooner than September because I think we're going to get to a place very, very soon where it doesn't even make sense not to be back. And I think when that happens, everybody will start to trickle in. Carol? Yeah, just to really, you know, reiterate, there are measures already in place to come back safely and each organization does need to look at their particular procedures, but there are systems already set up to welcome you back to the offices, to welcome you back to the city, and that will only encourage further recovery for us. And we can do so together and we can do so safely. And there's a lot of support around to keep those measures in place. But I will really just say to people that this is really a great city to continue to support and know that there's measures in place to return back safely. Jerry? Yeah, look, I know look, you've said it already, but say it again. <laughs> no, no, I, I think, uh, look, I think this has been a great discussion. I, I guess, you know, it's, uh, it, 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 it's always good to step back once in a while. And look, this has been a challenging 14, 15 months for all of us. It's, it's, it's been a time, honestly, for, for everyone to count their blessings, recognize what they've been given, uh, reach out to others who have not been as fortunate. And I think, you know, that process has taught us all how interconnected we all are. And uh, and I think that, you know, the coming together of, uh, you know, even we're talking about different business interests today, you know, our individual success depends on our collective success. You know, the, the, the office business won't do that well in Philadelphia unless there's a vibrant hotel tourism business. There's some vibrancy. Won't, won't be successful unless there's great places for people to live and to eat. So the, I mean, I think the, the interdependence we all have on each other is really very important. I think, you know, we're talking about some of these initiatives. I'm just really encouraged that uh, people are beginning to rise above the fray in their own vested interest to focus on where we want the city to get to. And, and I really do fundamentally, I've always believed this, that if we believe we, we, we can be successful, we will be successful. And I hope coming out of this, we, we remember the lessons that we, that we learned going into it, we remember the process of, of enduring it, and now we can celebrate coming out of it and hopefully make, uh, make our city so much better than it was even with all the, all the opportunities we had going into the pandemic. And I, and I think the level of engagement I've seen in every part of the city, whether it's a, a, a center city neighborhood or, or a neighborhood in West Philadelphia, people recognize this has been a seminal moment for all of us. And we recognize that we're all, we're all linked together and how we come out of this and work together to make the city a great success is dependent on each one of us. And I know uh, all of the folks I work with at Brandywine, all of the folks we talk to, we're all committed to making the city much better uh, post pandemic than it was pre pandemic. And I think with, 
the great work that everyone's doing, we can actually get there. You know, the only last thing I would say is if you go back 14 months ago and suddenly and realize that we had no idea what this was, how to deal with it, and here we are with three vaccines being distributed, we're at 40% vaccinated in the city, 45% in the suburbs. It is really remarkable how quickly we really responded to this. So one, again, our state of center city report and our monthly recovery report can be found on our website. I want to thank Prima for her great job in moderating and thank our panelists, Jerry Sweeney, Carol Watson, and Jim Perlstein for offering their thoughts. There will be, and you've gotten an email already about the next panel, which goes to the issue of outdoor seating, of transportation, of streets, and particularly how important it is for SEPTA to be on that path of recovery so we can all come back to work. So thank you all for joining us. Please offer a, a round round of applause, even if they can't see you, for our panelists, and thank you for joining us this afternoon. Yeah. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. Thank you, thank you all.